Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Billy Clark, and I'm a part of the team here at Culture Hub. Uh, I want to welcome you to um, a virtual gallery tour of ReFest. Um, and I want to start by just thanking uh, our partners that are involved uh, in ReFest this year. It's our 10th anniversary, and uh, we have 10 partners to sort of mark and celebrate um, our 10th year. And so we have uh, Arium, High Desert Soundings, Hot Shop Muffler, Hyphen Hub, La Mama, Linea del Arte, uh, the Ciencia y Tecnologia y Artes, Seoul Institute of the Arts, Super Collider, SVA Bio Art Lab, and UCLA Art Science Center. Uh, so we're, we're really, really happy to be able to partner with such amazing organizations, uh, uh, some of them international, some in LA, some in New York. Um, just for context, uh, you know, I'm uh, right now, I'm in New York, it's raining outside, um, but this uh, exhibition uh, is across two cities uh, and also expands into um, the digital space. Come on in. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so you can, uh, the, the hope is, is that through this live stream, you'll get to be introduced to every work uh, that's in these exhibitions. Uh, and also, we encourage you to check out uh, the online space, uh, which is created in Arium, uh, where you can explore uh, about 60 video art pieces um, from international artists around the world. Um, without further ado, I think we'll move on to our first artist um, here in New York, uh, a piece called Ancient Futures by Nicole E. Messier and Victoria Mangli... Uh, me, <laughs> going to mess it up, uh, Manglinello, and uh, collectively they are Craftwork Collective, all right? So hopefully I'll get a little bit smoother with my uh, announcements as I move forward. Billy, can you hear me? Am, am I, is my, uh... oh yeah. Uh, can we pop over, why don't, maybe uh, before we start here, we'll pop over to Los Angeles and just say say hello to Maddie over there. Yeah, I just wanted to um, have the opportunity to brag that it's sunny here in Los Angeles where ReFest is also happening. Um, so hello, this is ReFest in LA. We are at Hotshot Muffler. Uh, We've got Johnny Stearns in, on the camera showing you the sites. Um, and it's been really exciting to be working with this uh, you know, ex community of artists here. Um, we've got a group exhibition. We have more performances happening this evening. Um, and, uh, and we've got some folks outside. And I'm actually gonna start outside, Billy. This is a new thing. The art is getting created live. Um, we're over here with the Lion Gallery. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull Onions over. Onions is an artist with the Lion Gallery, and um, I'm gonna let you sort of talk about what you're doing and, and what it, what's, what's up over here. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Onions, uh, out of Los Angeles, California. We're at Lamert Park. Um, this is my crew. We like, we uh, hang out, paint, make art in Lamert Park all the time. Uh, this is our first time actually working on one piece together, so it's been interesting to like watch the dynamics unfold. But uh, that being said, it's been great. It's a learning experience, wonderful experience. And uh, the piece we're working on right now is about uh, ancestors and how we're built on the shoulders of our ancestors. So when we come, the idea for it was renew fest, you know. So like, like the idea of you can. Oh, the idea is like you can renew things. Uh, but you're always gonna be repeating like old things and so be aware of the past and how to, I guess, push things into the future. Sort of long story, whatever, I don't know. Anyway, point is, is that's the piece they're working on now. Um, uh, Wanna introduce a couple of your folks? Yeah, how about that? Yeah. This is Cahill. Cahill, you. Say how you doing? Hey, say something to the people. It's Cahill Sadiq, ghetto genius. My brother Onions, visual artist. Um, we are we're, uh, uh, Renaissance people. We're 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 
it's a collective of brilliancy and um, just love. And you, you got love back here. You know, it, it's different. You know, it, we just we just communicate sometimes in a different type of way. But it's all love, and we're working on this piece together, and it's gonna be cool. So let's do it. show the piece a little bit we're, we're in progress we'll cut back every once in a while this is the progress all right we'll cut back and forth between the pride of Lamert later on pretty good okay Billy take Great. us away Great, so amazing, man. We're very jealous of the weather you're having out there. I gotta say, you know, it's we're, we're really we're really representing New York today uh, with the with the cold and rain and wet. Um, I'm gonna pass things off uh, to Nicole and Victoria. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about their uh, process of collaboration, about the piece that you're looking at behind me. Um, and here we go. Hi, my name is Victoria Manganello, and this is a project called Ancient Futures. Uh, it's a textile that's been woven in a triple weave technique, and um, in included within it are some conventional textile materials like cotton and polyester, along with some fiber optical weaving devices. And so conceptually, we're exploring the history of textiles and technology in the nation um, across time and space in different ways that people shared information across various forms of textile, uh, but we're looking to the future and we're uh, including some curious technology to activate some of these uh, rich whole world points. Hi, I'm Nicole Yi Messier. Um, so this is an interactive textile installation, and so you can come up to it and share a secret with it. It will take your audio, translate it to text, and use that natural language processing um, algorithm to get the sentiment of that message and then reflect it back in light. So if your message is um, on a rudimentary level more happy or reflect in red and then uh, more kind of a negative feeling in blue and the idea is that as this piece travels um, the kind of ambiance and mood of the textile will change with the community it's in. So we have made this work in collaboration, and we also consider it uh, in progress. So we, as two artists working together, we really like the idea of showing our work as we're making it, and it seems like perhaps it'll never be totally done. Um, we have another set of pieces like these over in LA with you all. OK. So, um, you're gonna, we're gonna jump over to you, Maddie. Yeah, so this is one of the first times that we've been fortunate enough to actually represent um, artists, the same artist across the two cities uh, in a physical way. Um, so it's pretty exciting for us. Great. So I would like to uh, come over and look at a work by Juan Villanueva. Um, and I just want to say that this uh, just, uh, um, Juan will tell you more about the work, but this piece um, came out of uh, a residency at the SVA BioArt Lab, and SVA BioArt Lab is, uh, was really the first um, BioArt Lab uh, to be inside of an art school in the U.S. Um, and they have a residency program, and uh, Juan participated in that, and this is uh, one of the works that was created. So I'm going to pass you over to Juan to talk a little bit more about the work. Hello, everybody. My name is Juan Villanueva. I'm an artist originally from South Texas, a small town called Alice, Texas. Shout out Alice, Texas. Um, and so um, this piece 
uh, came about uh, uh, through the residency at SVA. I was doing a lot of work about um, experiencing the uh, pandemic here in New York City and kind of dealing with those emotions and reflecting on that time and how much um, we were seeking for alternative modes of health and thinking about um, the past. And so I came to this piece following SVA, kind of really digesting some of those um, principles that I picked up. And this piece um, came about, it's a piece about my grandmother really. Uh, she studied curanderismo, which is a traditional healing practice that's very common in South Texas and uh, parts of Mexico, I'm sure Southern California as well. Um, but what it speaks to is these lost traditions that we um, experience. Uh, I, I really wish I had learned more about uh, some of these uh, traditions and these practices that she, uh, she had for the family um, and used to, to cure um, different illnesses and her uh, love for nature and um, herbalism. And so you'll see on the bottom there is a ceremony piece which is very traditional, but in a more modern aesthetic. Uh, very traditional would be uh, a lot more elements. This is more like a pared down minimal version. Then the piece above is kind of like this idea of these roots being ripped out of, from uh, that history and elements from my childhood as well as things that I uh, created in the studio uh, like uh, out of SCOBY, which is a symbiotic culture bacterial yeast, so these um, uh, pseudo pods here um, are created from those, um, kind of representing the cycle of life, so you'll have like the uh, small worms here that were laid, that hatched out of these eggs, then uh, came into these chrysalis, and then eventually turned into butterflies, and so there's a few butterflies hanging around, and everything is made out of natural materials. I'm also a florist and gardener by trade, and so that is um, kind of where that marriage is. And so the piece kind of speaks to all of those things that I was kind of thinking about. Um, but yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so um, yes, so now I think we're gonna, we're gonna pop over and look at another piece that came again through this collaboration with the uh, SVA BioArt Lab. And uh, it's a piece called Living Taxidermy. And this piece is by uh, Nicholas Del Castillo. Uh, and I'm just going to read a little bit uh, about uh, this piece. So um, taxidermy, and, uh, taxidermy and death go hand in hand. But through the use of biomaterials, a piece of taxidermy can be grown from scratch. Mycelium forms uh, mimic the commercial polyurethane animal bodies used for the practice and serve as an environmentally friendly biodegradable alternative. So you'll see that some of the uh, similar materials are used in this piece that are used in Juan's piece. Um, and I think it's also just sort of looking at and speculating like what if there were different ways of, of doing things. Um, uh, I think now we're going to jump over to. Uh, Blair, is Blair here? Hold on, okay. Blair has come over to LA again. Okay, you're gonna jump over there first? Okay, sorry about that. Gonna pass, <laughs> pass, uh, pass over to LA. Okay, cool, here we are. And I'm here with Isabel Beavers. Hello. Um, and Isabel is the um, artistic director of Super Collider, who's one of our partners. Um, this year, and Isabel is going to, you know, talk us through some of these pieces. But maybe you want to just talk for a, a brief moment about the partnership. Absolutely. Well, hi everyone. Again, my name is Isabel Beavers. I'm the artistic director of Super Collider. I'm not used to talking in mic, so I hope I'm like doing this at the correct distance. But um, we're so happy to collaborate with Culture Hub. I think this is the third or fourth year that we've worked on Refest together. So it's always just a wonderful collaboration for us. We are an art, science, and technology collective based in LA. We do exhibitions in LA and beyond and have a, a, a number of different programs, the main one being our SCI Art Ambassador program. So many of the artists that are representing Super Collider here 
are either in our ambassador program now or have been in past years. So we're just ecstatic to be with you all. Um, I think the first piece I'll talk about that is created by an artist who is involved with Super Collider is this piece called Four Larval Hydra Hydroids Drifting Up the Water Column, also known as a four shaft cylindrical loom. And this is a work by Emma Akmak John. And Emma does a lot of work thinking about marine science and weaving practices in the ocean. So she has built this loom herself. Um, cylindrical looms are very rare, but she has fabricated all the pieces of this loom from a boat that she found uh, washed up on the beach and then a lot of other materials that she fabricated in the lab at UCLA where she recently graduated. So it's a fully functional loom. It's still in the process of being built, but the rocks that you see on the outside help create tension on these silk-based strings. So when it's totally complete, she will be able to use the petals down here and to weave a cylindrical um, weaving that will turn into her artwork. So really exciting. We were really happy for Emma to be able to exhibit this piece. Cool, let's go back over to uh, Blair because I've got some of her work right behind me and then we'll check back in with some more super collider pieces. So I'm here with uh, Blair Simmons and uh, you know, uh, Blair just pointed out um, a few minutes ago that we've known each other for four years now. And uh, Blair uh, was a um, resident artist at Culture Hub uh, working on a project called Print Dialogue, right? And, uh, and that piece uh, was before this whole wave of AI technology that's, that's hit us uh, like a storm this year. And I think it's interesting. I was thinking about that piece a lot. Um, so uh, I hope I don't misspeak. If I do, Blair, you can jump in. But, the, but, but essentially in that work, um, Blair was training uh, or creating like uh, software, uh, training uh, through machine learning, uh, um, this software to write uh, dialogue, essentially. And we thought it was really funny dialogue. And, <laughs> and, and so we decided to stage it. Uh, and Maddie uh, over there in Los Angeles uh, worked with Blair to direct some of these pieces along with the Great Jones Repertory Company, which is uh, La Ma one of La Mama's resident companies and how I came to La Mama. And um, so anyway, just uh, just thinking about that kind of past history and some of the works that you'll see uh, today, in in including uh, Nicole and Victoria's piece, uh, came out of residency through, through Culture Hub. So uh, Blair has since gone on to start uh, working on, on a variety of other projects. And I'm going to pass the mic to you, Blair, to kind of describe the work that's in the show today. So nice to hear about because honestly, I was telling, I don't know, someone was in here earlier and I was telling them this is the first artist residency I ever got four years ago. And it was the best artist residency. It was amazing. It was like so supportive. And I, I think you all sort of really understood my work, um, like where it was at when it was at that place. And, and, and you seem to like where it is now because it's interesting. That piece was, it was dialogue and it was dialogue that was, written off of my own voice. It was like I wanted to see language performed in my own vo voice for the first time. And then what is interesting is then I really started to, over the last few years, acknowledge the sort of chronic pain and anxiety that my devices were giving me. And so that I was really in a place in that moment where I was working with technology in a way that was like full of passion and like excited. And I and then I got to sort of a darker space um, where then I was like, this is hurting me. <laughs> I was like, this stuff hurts. Um, and so I started to um, really start to play with, you know, what it would look like to make that pain that I was feeling physical. Um, and so actually one of the pieces I started with is over here. So this is my, this is the, one of the first pieces I made in this series. There's 18 of these. Um, and this is my high school laptop. Um, and so this is my high school laptop. This piece is called Portrait of the Artist from ages 16 to 21. And this piece is really 
like <laughs> a very like humorous pain object. I don't do that. I don't know if that sounds funny to anybody, but it is <laughs> to me because it's um, you know our devices are really made out of metal and minerals and rocks, and um, I put it back into that state, um, put it back into rock, and I hammered at it for five hours, um, and I called it a portrait. Um, and then once I did that, it has, by the way, all the data on it. It's got my bad high school essays, like really bad, <laughs> like really bad essays. And like all of the iTunes songs that I purchased, I think there's like a lot of glee, like a lot of glee on there. And then, um, and then I started to do that and people started saying, I have that device under my bed. Like I have like, I've been keeping this for eight years and don't want to get rid of it and feel attached to it. And so... Then I started doing a series, and um, this is Portrait of Sarah, this is Portrait of Matt, um, this is Gabby, um, and then in L.A. there are some other pieces as well. Um, yeah, let's pop over to L.A. I turned around as if it was behind me. <laughs> Directionally? Oh, oh, there it is. Kind of behind you. <laughs> cool, so we can just show these pieces. Maybe, Blair, you can... Yeah, Let so that's a, a little blackberry. Yeah, that's a blackberry. Um, I got to be honest, I made so many of these. I cannot remember whose that is, which is kind of devastating. Um, but that one's one of the pieces that is like more in motion. Um, yeah, I can't remember, <laughs> but it in somewhere on a document in my computer, which I promise I won't put in concrete. The name of that piece exists. <laughs> Okay, what's that one? Oh, that one I think is Portrait of Anonymous. I love that piece a lot. So that is Portrait of Anonymous. I know that sounds funny, but that one actually is called that. Um, and, you know, in that one, because the person didn't want to be identified, I did hide most of the device. And so you can only really see parts of it in little corners. Yeah. So it comes out on one side there. And then, and you can see the chisel marks on that one really well. And then this is Portrait of Twins. Um, so this is, this is a, this is a pair of twins who gave me their old phones. Um, and this one feels very archaeological to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. These pieces are, are also, I think what I was really excited about was sort of elevating them too, right? So there are these pain objects, but then they're also, you know, these, these things we spend so much time with. I mean, I have mine, I have my phone right here. <laughs> You know, it's like literally on my person at all times. And I think, you know, we all have that. And I think it's it's very interesting to think about how attached we get to them and how we think of them as like an extension of ourselves. And what would it look like to think about our digital devices as portraits um, and think about like the, you know, the cached web history and thinking about, um, you know, I don't know, the time you spend with it, the people you talk to through it, how it's like also this it's like this thing that like that mediates joy but also can give pain and then I, I don't know I really wanted to like elevate it by actually putting it on a pedestal and like give it some respect you know for for the thing it's doing for us um I don't know holding that sort of tension of of pain and you know joy and celebration is sort of what these are trying to or what I'm trying to do with these pieces um I feel like I talked too long no <laughs> no you knew this would happen you said this would I did not say that, and did I? Well, you can't talk too long, Blair. You could never talk too long. Uh, they, they're going to be so uh, pleased to have a break from me. So, um, all right. So, uh, Maddie, are we jumping over back over to some works over there with you, or should we move through uh, yep. uh, over here? Okay. So, jumping over to LA again. Thank so you, let's Blair. Let's set up the shot. This is, this is um, Jameson Edgar's work. We've got a lovely stand-in viewer who is a choreographer at ReFest. Um, but this piece is White Man's Foot. Um, and White Man's Foot is a video essay that choreographs the cultural and technological legacies of one of America's oldest invasive plant species, Plantago Major. The video weaves together performance documentation with found footage and participatory computer animations to explore the ways in which non-human species have been assembled into technologies of surveillance and colonization throughout American history. Uh, and that piece is by Jameson Edgar. Um, Huntress Janos is the animation collaborator. Um, and that was also curated through a partnership with Super Collider. And now we're going to check out another piece. 
um, by Lore Michelon. So this is a work by Lore Michelon, and this piece is called Machinic Reflections, and it has used machine learning to critique the biases inherent in artificial intelligence and machine learning, particularly in facial recognition. So Lore has trained um, an algorithm on this massive data set of images um, of folks of different professions. So there's architect, artists, astronauts, butchers. I just got butcher when I did the, the, the game, so that was really fun. Um, and this data set has been fed into an algorithm. So when someone stands in front of the piece, there's a camera that reads your face um, and based on the algorithm assigns you uh, a profession of what it thinks you are. So I just got butcher, 11% um, and conspiracy theorist. I guess we're tied for conspiracy theorist and butcher, which feels right to me. Um, there's also masks here that Laura has made in case anyone does not want their face to be recorded. Um, this particular piece does not keep the data once your face has been recorded and you've been given a category, it, like the, the data is wiped from that. Um, but the, the piece has exhibited here, we've exhibited a few times with Super Collider before, but is interactive and yeah, really interesting critique on the biases inherent in machine learning and algorithms that we're surrounded by all the time. And now we talk about Kate. Yeah, so we'll just move right on down to the next piece. Kate Parsons is also um, a SciArt ambassador in our current cohort. And this piece is called Bloom. It um, is in the form of augmented reality for this exhibition, where there is a still image that prompts the app uh, to show an animation from the VR piece. Bloom also exists as a virtual reality piece. And it's a meditation on death and rebirth. Um, and Kate's work is very interested in the intersection of ecology and technology. Back to you, oh, New York. Amazing, such, such, such incredible, incredible work. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a collection of people over here and we're watching all on the big screen and um, it's, it's really exciting to be able to, uh, to see those pieces that, that otherwise we wouldn't be able to see. Um, so uh, back over here, I'm standing next to, uh, next to a work and, and you'll notice that there are um, a lot of works uh, in uh, this exhibition that are uh, from Colombian artists and we're making uh, a concerted effort uh, to partner um, uh, and one of the partners uh, in Colombia and in Latin America uh, were trying to uh, eventually create a culture hub uh, in that region, per perhaps in Bogota. And um, uh, I would just want to give a shout out to Asher Rimi Toledo, who is um, uh, the co-founder of uh, Hyphen Hub, and, um, and some of the artists in this show uh, were curated in uh, by Hyphen Hub, uh, and, and this is one of them. Uh, so this is uh, Jorge Barco, and the piece is Tiempos de Ruido, Times of Noise. I'm just going to turn it on, and then I'll read the description for you. So you can click this switch on. And it's a little uh, audio box. So um, the description is a strong and, and mysterious sound uh, from an unknown object uh, shook the Santa Fe village in Bogota the night of March 9th, 19, oh, sorry, 1687. Throughout history, there have been different hypotheses about the causes uh, of this fact from the first apocalyptic perspectives as a demonic manifestation uh, from the end of time, uh, to the scientific explanation surrounding volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and the uh, uh, telluric movements. Um, nowadays, uh, the most documented version uh, date, uh, dates its origin to a meteorite uh, entering the terrestrial atmosphere with its subsequent sound wave crashes. Um, and this artist is presenting a, a large a collection of these boxes 
uh, all in uh, one space uh, now in, in Colombia. Um, I think now we're going to uh, move back and speak with, uh, again, one of our resident artists, Sarah Sweeney, um, about her piece, Conversations with My Deep Fake Dad. So Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how this work came about and about the project? Sure, absolutely. Um, this is a project that I've been making for about a year and a half now. Um, the piece came about because I was interested in deep fakes and um, I became the same age as my dad was when he died. And I had this thought, well, why don't I make a deep fake of him so that I can talk to him? Um, so there was, that was really what this piece was about. And um, it's not what most of my work is. My work often is photography. So it's my first sound piece. Um, and I contacted a company um, named Resemble AI, and they said, no. Um, and then we had another conversation, and they said, yes, um, we would like to help you. And so they created a model of his voice based on all of these cassette tapes I had. Um, and the model was made, I think, uh, about a year ago, somewhere in there. Um, and then I started creating these conversations. Recorded the script. Um, my part was recorded by me. And then um, my dad's part was recorded by Billy, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and it was recorded by Billy, and then it gets r run through Resemble and transformed into my father's voice. Um, and one of the most fantastic moments was to hear um, Billy sort of speak the script that I had written, because um, it sounds like my dad about half the time, which is kind of incredible. Um, this particular thing is <laughs> Uh, probably because of Maddie, because we talked about, well, how will it show in a gallery? And we had no idea. So uh, I was like, let's make a phone booth. That seems right. Um, and so all of these people helped me make it. Um, three amazing students from the school teach at Skidmore College, um, Zoe, Omar, and David, did the entire, uh, the entire electronics of it. And what happens is when you get in, and this amazing mural thing is made by Deandra, um, when you get conversation, it's going to be based just on recordings from him and letters. And I didn't have it done. And then we decided we should have it for the LA piece, or at least the beginning part. So it's actually in LA on a rotary phone. You can pick it up and have it sent up there. So that was an amazing experience. Maybe we can show the LA side. So here's this piece here. They've got the rotary phone. I'm just gonna I'm gonna model the interaction. And now I'm listening to a conversation between Sarah and her deep fake dad. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I have to say, I mean, just shout out to Deandra, who um, was was just mentioned in terms of these these graphics that were a, a, a derivative of a of a, uh, you know Sarah's a photographer, and um, and so these came from that from that a, another project, um, and then were processed by by Deandra, and I, I have to say it was it was a very Unique and unusual experience to uh, collaborate on this project, and and uh, to I, I spent a lot of time listening to uh, Sarah's father's voice, um, and and trying to embody that, and and um, yeah, it was an emotional experience that I will never forget. Um, I think we're gonna pass back to you, Maddie, in Los Angeles, to uh, show us some work over there. Am I right? Cool. Yeah, so we have um, a sculpture piece uh, with, by Iman Person here. Um, it's high fire ceramics, bioplastic plants, and plant hormones. So this sculpture is seated atop this sort of bioplastic um, shindig. And then it's sort of uh, giving company to this piece by Kira Zonarica. And I'm going to pass over to Isabel to talk about it. This work by Kira Zonarica is titled Coral Reef, and 
Uh, in Kira's practice, she collaborates with AI uh, from an indigenous and gender expansive epistemology. Wear on your back, and so you can go to a park wherever you are. Um, we've also got some fake plants here, uh, so that's a nice little portable park. And we've got a 3D park that we can drive around in. Because um, in the future, let's see what Pekka writes about it. Green time is a growing concept that emphasizes spending time in nature for physical and mental well-being. This idea is not new, as earlier health practitioners recognized the importance of fresh air. However, our modern lives involve spending increasing amounts of time indoors, leading many to seek out more ways to add green to their routines. Welcome to the Portable Park, your personal source of fresh air. Back to you, New York. <laughs> wow, that's super cool. It it reminds me a little bit of uh, some of the Nan Jun Paik pieces where he was putting the TVs in, in inside of the plants. Um, but yeah, I need I need a little bit more of that. I got to throw that on my television instead of some of the other stuff I've been looking at. Um, so, oh my goodness, maybe we're on the the video piece that I was going to show you right now is on the credits. Um, so not the most optimal time to be showing. Do you have a pro uh, something you could show us over there, uh, Maddie, while I wait for this to cycle through? Here, you go to Eva Davidova. Yeah, sounds good. And Eva is here. So I'm going to pass the mic to Eva to tell you a little bit about her piece, Global Mode, Horsewoman Appearing Normal, right? so much. Uh, this piece uh, was uh, a spontaneous form um, here uh, to investigate the relationship between us and other beings and how our world and our beings interact. Hey, Eva, can you hold the mic closer to your mouth? Yes. So this was born yeah. uh, from years of investigating our relationship to other beings and uh, how our cruelty towards this, these others also makes um, intellectual room or ideological room for cruelty against uh, everybody, us included. In this serious global mode, many animals appear as women or as prey and um, this particular one i love the best because it's undefined it is a prey animal but it can't be said if it's a cow or a sheep or whatever other animal people decide to it um, it is ambiguous because it's both set up itself for extinction or for death or has been set up by others. And uh, I like the ambiguity, and I also like the uh, fact that I'm using a holophone, which is usually used in advertising to um, advertise consumer goods. I think it's really also important to point out that um, you can't really document this work um, so what you're seeing uh, is not actually what we're seeing. Uh, what you're seeing on video is not what we're seeing in New York. There's actually an uh, image. It's uh, being disrupted um, as it gets transposed into uh, a, a camera or, or video. Um, great. So I'm going to slide down here and show you... Um, Biofacts and Biofictions, uh, which is a collection of things by uh, Tara Rhoda from the SVA Bio Art Lab. Maybe we can get a shot of that, um, Deandra. Yeah, so again, this is a collection of specimens and jars that have been stained and cleared, dehydrated, specimens preserved with resin, and assortments of biomaterials such as leather grown from bacteria, uh, sculptures grown from mycelium, bioplastics, uh, liquids cast using um, 
spherification, and an assortment of artifacts from various uh, bioart projects from the SBA Bioart Lab. Maddie, can we go back to you? Yes, back to Los Angeles, where I'm here with Marcus Quila Nazario. Did I say it right? I said it right. Um, and this is Macho Stereo. This is the sort of lounge edition. So we're going to call it Macho Stereo Lounge. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Marcus to, you know, tell us what's up. Uh, well, this is like a little Macho Stereo micro lounge. Uh, Macho Stereo is a collective project that I'm the ringleader of, along with collaborators Roshi Clark, Paul Donald, and Jenny Amaya. And it includes a two channel video, a custom wallpaper. Um, an interactive listening station, a bar, and, and some oranges. Um, at the heart of the project is um, uh, masculinity and men, hence the name Macho Stereo. Um, I, my dad wouldn't let me touch his stereo or his bar or anything ever when I was a kid. And he was very violent and we had a really uh, complicated uh, relationship that we eventually healed. Um, and I wanted to talk to other men about um, the same kinds of issues and about masculinity. So I was in residency um, at the Santa Monica Public Library, and I collected a bunch of audio interviews um, from um, men about their fathers um, at the library. I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. And so I kind of made a trap of like trying to get you to sit and listen to these interviews about um, men and their fathers. Um, this is an ongoing project. I'm continuing um, the interviews, and uh, the work uh, keeps morphing. Um, so here's like a little micro uh, selection um, from the larger work. Um, I did a collage workshop where I invited people to bring ephemera, uh, death certificates, high school uh, diplomas, whatever, and then we made collages. And then it was basically a way to get them to talk about their fathers with me. So this is the one I made. Um, and uh, part of this uh, um, project also is a live performance that happens um, with Paul Donald. And so today at six o'clock, we'll be performing and we'll be making Last time we performed, we made these helmets um, from scratch. There were seven of us. Um, and this time, we're making a breastplate that's sort of a prototype. And it's kind of about failure and the failure of masculinity and how how it's, um, you know, each thing you build is going to be different. And um, uh, soon these uh, interviews will be on online for people to listen to. Yeah, and it's a it's a pretty fun interactive installation because if you hang out with Marcus long enough, you might get some uh, rum and guava cocktail. But you got to work for it, famously. So you got to talk. You got to talk about your dad if you if you want to get there. This is a a record of Runaways by Liz Suedos. So just threading that La Mama needle from uh, the east to the west coast. Um, New York, we've got a, a few folks hanging out in VR here. Should we talk talk to them? Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. I don't know if that's a yes, but I think we're going to go for it. That was a so no. That was a no. No, oh, okay, sorry, I can't see you. I'm back back here, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I just had a couple questions for Marcus before you moved on. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so maybe so, we can save them for the long table because we can't see you back here. Sure, um, but you can hear me, right? I guess not. Okay, so we'll move on. Let's go back to LA and pass it off to Maddie. We're gonna go see the next artist. Oh, okay, sorry. I we we couldn't see you and hear you back here. Okay, so I'm here with Yara and she's got a piece belonging XR. Maybe we can first just show what's up back here. Um we've got two VR headsets. Um and there they are. And what they're seeing is a VR version of this piece that is projected onto the wall. And I'm gonna hand the mic to Yara so she can talk a little bit about the piece and the work. Hey everyone, I'm Yara. I'm part of Policy's lab and this is our work, Belonging XR. So Belonging is mainly the story of Amal, which is a Lebanese immigrant that just landed in Los Angeles and is making her way from the airport to downtown, not through the highway, but through the residential neighborhood. 
And she is looking for signs of her community. She's looking for signs of belonging of her queer communities in LA. And she's trying to see if it's a safe place for her to land and make a life. And it's mainly um, the representation of a lot of different residential houses in LA. And we 3D scan them and we put them on the same, along the same street. And then we added uh, stereotypical signs of subculture of women identified uh, queer, queer women identifying subcultures. And all of these signs are placed on the front porches and their yards. And you're meant to get in VR. And, and we love little doggies too. But you're meant to be in VR and to look at these houses and listen to the beautiful Arabic music in the background. And it feels like they're sitting in a car. So it's uh, mimicking her ride back to um, back from the airport to downtown. And they're looking for signs of queer identity on the front porch, as Amal was doing in our narrative, to see if she can belong and she can be safe in LA as a queer Arabic woman. Maddie, back to you. I think we're starting to get a kick out of this like uh, broadcast vibe. So thank you, Yara. And uh, New York, uh, back to you. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm standing next to a piece here uh, by uh, Juan Cortez, uh, and this piece is called On Vegetal Politics. Uh, it's the piece here, the darker piece on this side, on the right, the, to the right of me. And next to it is uh, Botanica uh, Transgenica, um, which is also by Juan Cortez and Attractor Studio. So uh, uh, Juan is a member of Attractor Studio. Uh, this is also uh, a Colombian uh, media arts, uh, art and technology collective. Um, and these artists uh, came to us uh, through Hyphen Hub. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit about these uh, pieces. So on vegetal politics, it focuses on uh, the, case, uh, the case of soy monoculture an accelerated expansion in South American territories. The political struggles waged in Latin America around the issue of food sovereignty, deep peace to the right, uh, Botanica Transgenica. Um, uh, going to read a little bit about that. Botanica Transgenica shows the sequencing of the soybean and cocoa plant, respectively, in comparison to the genetic modifications that companies like Syngenta uh, uh, have made uh, for uh, proprietary use. The work presents an algorithm that searches for the patents of the modified genetic codes of these plants and privately registers them uh, as an NFT. Uh, this is an act that draws attention to the ownership of genetic codes uh, and rights over the modification of plant life, especially in the midst of struggles for food sovereignty in Latin America. And uh, I had the good fortune of traveling with Asher uh, to Bogota uh, and Managales, uh, which was my first time in Latin America this fall. I, I got to see this piece uh, in a different form. It was um, uh, actually a three-channel uh, video piece. Um, and uh, this piece has been presented in a variety of different ways, uh, one of which is a much larger installation with a whole root infrastructure. So I just wanted to say that um, this is a, a smaller version of, of, uh, of, a, of a, larger, a larger piece. Um, all right, we're gonna slide down and also look uh, here at uh, food from Upper Bogota River by uh, Mar uh, Maria. Uh, Buena Ventura, uh, which is also another uh, Colombian artist. Uh, in this uh, piece, maybe we can um, we can zoom out so you can see the the wider, uh, the full perspective of the uh, uh, the installation. Um, this piece uh, brings together some documents from the process of searching for the captain fish, uh, which you can see. Um, represented in some of these photographs, like here. Um, yeah. And also, uh, here is a good shot. Uh, 
so the Captain Fish is um, uh, something that uh, Maria has been investigating uh, since 2008. It's a Bogota fish that was a main, um, main food of this place until the 19th century and was completely forgotten uh, by the current inhabitants of the city uh, and its surroundings. Um, this is because of the contamination of the waters made its life in the city impossible and relegated uh, the fish uh, to a few still living lagoons of the highlands. And so um, Maria basically worked for many, many uh, years on trying to actually repopulate this fish that was close to extinction. And this uh, um, installation um, is uh, a derivative of, of that activist work. So I think we're going to pass back to you, Maddie. Uh, we'll see you later with um, Bobby Joe Smith. And maybe we can first just show the artwork from its outset. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Bobby Joe, who can speak a little bit about what you're seeing. Hello, everyone in New York. Um, I'm Bobby Joe Smith III. I'm a media artist uh, in, living here in LA. This piece is called Wakiksuye, which means an object of remembrance in my native language of Lakota. Um, this artwork came about uh, wanting to renew and restore some of the original reasons or traditional reasons that my tribe made artwork. Um, and oftentimes our artwork is considered to be either craft or is miscategorized and put in some other place because our art, there was no real difference between an artwork and a sacred object and a tool that is of, of use. And um, so I wanted to kind of renew some of that spirit by making an artwork that was specifically for a loved one, for a relative of mine and allow them to then be able to activate it in a way that is meaningful and useful to them. So what I have here is a um, traditional style uh, broadcloth dress, um, Lakota style, and on it are um, a number of sort of memory drives in which um, my, my relative was able to upload images that were of meaning to her. Um, and during the performance, she was able to activate it by being in it and doing a performance. Um, and the traditional broadcloth dress was something that was created during the period of colonization when we were receiving um, government rations of broadcloth, basically. Uh, but they kept some of the design patterns that came from buckskin, which were something that was the ways in which we were making clothing. Um, but since we weren't allowed to hunt in the same way that we were able to, um, we took our design and we implemented it and put it on this particular government ration that we were receiving. Um, the video that these things are connected to um, are her expressions. So whatever she decided to put on there, when you plug it in, it's able to play it on, on these monitors here. And uh, my relative, her name is Landy Keepsiegel. Um, she is somebody who has engaged frequently in the revitalization of our culture, but also in decolonial movements within our, within our tribe. For example, um, the fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline, which, being built, uh, which was built a mile north of our reservation where we're from in Standing Rock. Um, she was very instrumental in helping out on the ground with a lot of um, the efforts that were there. And she now lives in LA, and she's thinking a lot about media and how we're portrayed within, um, within culture, but also, what it means to do an artwork that has something to do with our culture, in which ways we're presenting our culture, um, what does it mean to present our culture, what does it mean to present some things that were just meant to be for us, that were just meant to be within our community, how do we pass down tradition, how do we pass down memories without it being appropriated or misused in the wrong way, can you still pass certain things down without the lifestyle and, and the values that were within our community, if those things started to disappear as we've been more assimilated into uh, mainstream culture, um, do those things still have meaning? Um, so this is kind of where this project is and um, something that we're looking to continue to develop and, and think through. And so uh, Bobby Joe's cousin, Laundy, performed in this dress last night, um, sort of a movement piece with, and it was very interactive. And if you catch maybe Johnny, the back of the dress, 
Um, these cords, uh, these are memory sticks that are connected to the dress that then when plugged in, um, these monitors uh, initially say um, upload memories here. And uh, during the performance, she plugged in these USB sticks and the memories started popping up on the screens. The, the way that these are plugged in resemble piercings that were done um, during our Sundance ceremonies, which is a way in which we sacrifice for ourselves for the betterment of the community in a way to heal the community. Um, it's also something that is particularly sacred and something that we tend to not show to the outside world um, for a number of reasons. A lot of times when we did present our culture, it was misunderstood, and that could lead to de uh, criminalization of our practices and even death. Um, but that Sundance ceremony was a way to honor your relatives and also a way to connect with your relatives. So these themes of connection, of, of piercing, of sacrifice, of women holding our culture and holding so many aspects of who we are as a people and the burden that comes with that are kind of all sort of being built into, into this work. Um, and then one of the things just as an artist is removing some control that I have and having to be comfortable with that, having to, um, one, make something not so much for the gallery, but for a loved one and really having that be in collaboration. But then when you have an artwork and you give it to somebody, it's theirs to activate in whatever way that they want. Um, so being able to step back and see that happen and be surprised, I'm still trying to assess and analyze what this all means. And I think that's a, a new beautiful expression for me as an artist. I usually know ahead of time what this is supposed to be about, um, but to have that sort of um, cross collaboration is something that I, I'm thinking through and I'm really enjoying. Cool. Thanks, Bobby Joe Smith the third. And um, that's those are our artworks here. And so New York, you want to close us out, and then we're gonna slide right into a conversation with the Johnny Branham about these works and more. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm standing next to a piece here uh, again uh, that came to us through uh, a collaboration with SVA BioArt Lab. Uh, it's called the Ant Box. It's by Yi Huang. And um, uh, the description is ants are highly social insects that originated in the early crustaceous period and thrive with the emergence of flowering plants. Researchers have long known that ants utilize phenomenon as a means of communication with one another. In my artwork titled The Ant Box, I have electronically connected ants to the sound system in order to create an auditory representation of their movements as the ants move they trigger the playing of simple piano chords, resulting in a unique uh, um, experience that reflects the life of the creatures. Okay, I'm gonna slide uh, quickly over here to Suzanne Anker's work. Um, and Suzanne Anker is, uh, is the founder of the uh, SVA Bio Art Lab and uh, the chair of the Fine Arts Department at SVA. So this piece is called Biota, uh, and uh, Biota is a porcelain sculptural installation employing the morphology of the sea sponge as a matrix. Um, these sculptures act as fossils that commemorating the, t uh, the time reefs were living entities. So many people have uh, looked at these sculptures and asked how, how they were made. Um, uh, the, the, the process is, is was, uh, above my pay grade, it was hard for me to understand, but the <laughs> but essentially um, they are they they are um, casts uh, made of porcelain, and um, it was a really uh, yeah really re really beautiful uh, process that was described to me, and I'm gonna have to go and do some more research on it to learn more about it. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump over here to blue dot. Maybe we can run back to Cloudix because this one's looping. Oh, no, here we go. So, um, so this is uh, the Blue Dot by Juan Pablo Pacheco. Um, the Blue Dot is a video essay, essay that speculates on the ecological and uh, epistemological uh, networks woven around the internet. The Blue Dot represents a real time sign of users' interactions with digital servers. Uh, but it also becomes a visual and material metaphor uh, for the planet Earth, the world's oceans, and the internet as a watery 
technology. Um, I think we have to hop back to Cloudix um, and then, um, or we can stop here. Um, we just have three more works here in the gallery. We'll go. Or maybe we'll jump back to, oh, here we go. This is uh, Las Memorias del Sol by all different media arts practices to create this rendering. Um, I'm gonna pop back to Cloudix. So this piece is called uh, Dance Permit Denied um, by Cloudix uh, Vanessix. Um, and Dance Permit, uh, Dance Permit Denied is an immersive film that uses artificial intelligence and performance art to challenge gender norms in traditional religious dances in indigenous Peru. It is an autobiographical documentary about the traditional dances of Claudius's family, uh, Los Negrasos de Spisas, uh, Spisa, um, that explores a centennial view of the themes of gender, memory, and uh, reinvention of the ancestral. And you're seeing it right now on a flat uh, 2D plane, but the piece is meant to be viewed uh, in a VR headset uh, in 360. So it's a 360 spherical video piece. Um, great. And now, Joe, I think we're going to jump down to your work, and we're going to wrap up with you. So, um, so the final work is uh, Joe Debs, and I'm gonna pass off to Joe, who can tell you a little bit more about his piece. Uh, okay, so my name is uh, Joe Debs. I'm actually based in LA. I happen to be in New York, so it just all worked out for me to do um, my piece in the New York show which is here. I'm not sure, uh, does that come out at all in this work? Um, this is a, um, a, a generative video. It's a very simple piece, really. Uh, it's, it's a clip of me drawing uh, based on very schematic um, diagramming language used in software development uh, and also for um, business process modeling. And uh, basically, it's like flowcharts. But I was really interested in the idea of taking these graphs and charts of things that are usually um, used to build blueprints for a closed system or like a rigid structure and to really open it up. Uh, so what I did is I made each clip uh, sort of independent improvisation. And, and what happens in the gallery is that it's, it's edited in real time so that it's always um, always recombining in a different way to make this kind of a open, endless diagram instead of something that's closed. But um, the real thing I'm interested in here is the, um, is really kind of a tension between something really tactile like a human hand and the chalk and the, you know, the texture of the chalkboard itself uh, and this very sort of austere, um, abstract, logical language. So. All of my work really does that. It's very different than the piece I did uh, in my Culture Hub residency in the fall uh, on the surface, but uh, on sort of a more deeper level, uh, it's about systems and people embedded in systems. So the, the fall residency piece I did in involved a group of performers who were performing uh, algorithms and systems based on the American military, and they were immersed in a game engine that was rendering um, a U.S. military base in Afghanistan and walking through an Unreal Engine rendered environment while they were executing protocols, procedures, algorithmic military uh, things that people do there uh, that generally desensitize the Americans from 
the culture that they're actually embedded in and fighting against. So um, in a way, this is a much more abstract piece, but it, it's very much in keeping with the performance of work. Thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate it. Um, great. So that wraps up. We've we've seen every uh, piece in both New York and LA's uh, ReFest exhibition this year. Um, we're going to take a few moments. So if you're online and you're watching online, please stay with us. Um, we're going to be having a, a conversation with Ajani uh, Branham uh, in just a few minutes. And then after that, we're going to go on to a long table discussion where we really uh, open it up uh, to uh, participants in both uh, the New York Gallery and out at, um, in LA uh, to, to have a conversation about the works and themes uh, inside the exhibition. So stick around. We'll be back shortly with uh, Ajani. <laughs>